Okay, Mark 10, Matthew 20, Luke 22, John 15. Got them? Mark 10 first. Okay, this is about the bully pulpit. Uh, That's how people think the way things are supposed to be. The ideas of being a bully. Okay, Mark chapter 10, verse 35. And uh, this, this uh, thought here is uh, found in Matthew, Mark, Luke. And then the Lord gives the alternative in John. Mark ten thirty five. Well, let's pray first. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words. I pray you'd enlighten our eyes. I do ask that uh, as believers we will automatically be put in a leadership position sometimes in our life that we might witness to somebody, might help them. I pray you'd help us to be the leaders that you want us to be according to your word, according to your example. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Mark 10, 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. He said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? And they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand, the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. And I dare say that's what most of our prayer requests are. We don't know what we're asking. <laughs> but can ye drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Okay, that technically is death, is sacrificial death. They said unto him, We can. Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I... Sh- that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all, shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, okay, so here's the mindset. Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. Okay, so there's a different method. Okay, now this Gentile method, method we all experience every single day, and so hopefully this will give you some understanding about things in life and how to be a proper leader. Okay, so, but so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Okay, let's go back to Matthew 20. I would like to read each of these passages because when the Bible repeats an idea, it's uh, repeated for emphasis, plus it's repeated because it is a major issue of life. Okay, so we all experience these things. uh, And the idea of exercising lordship. Okay, now Jesus is saying the Gentiles exercise lordship But I don't want you doing that. You're to be a servant. Now, American culture, because of the Christian influence, the people who helped found this country knew that government would operate by Gentiles and they would be tyrants. And so what the people did is they created an idea where anybody who got elected in a government position, what were they required to do the first day in a job? They were to take an oath, and they were to have a bond. A bond was to verify that they were going to remain a public servant. If a person knows how to follow the remedies, they can sue the individual on the bond. And if they don't get that, they're supposed to be out of office. Few of them do it, few of them are legit, but that's the intention. So originally, what was a sheriff called on the side of his car? A 
peace officer. You get that out of Isaiah 62. That's what the Lord has planned for the millennium. A peace officer. It's a Bible term. But in the 60s and 70s, we started seeing a shift. And now what are they called? Law enforcement. That's the ways of a Gentile. They lord it over somebody. They are nothing more than bullies. Now, it's really manifest in government entities, and I'll explain that a little bit more. And the Lord says it should be different for us believers. Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. Again, it's the same idea. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know the princes of the Gentiles, okay, princes, so that's the political figureheads, of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. And they that are great exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life for ransom for many. Okay, let's try Luke's uh, version of that. Luke 22. The Bible shows how to be an effective, quiet leader. Where people develop an idea that this person who's a leader over me... But yet this person cares for me. This person has my concerns at best interest. Okay, that's not how Gentiles do it. Luke 22, verse 21. I'm sorry, verse 24. And there was a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat. But I am among you as he that serveth. Okay, now here's the other way. John chapter 15 Verse 15, uh, as a believer in Jesus Christ, there are opportunities for you to witness or there's opportunities for you to be a leader. Any and all of us sometime in life will be a leader. What kind of a leader will we be? Will we be like the Gentiles who lord it over them? I'm in charge and we're going to do it this way. Okay, or are we going to be a leader like Jesus Christ? John 15, 15, here's what he told his apostles. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I've heard of my Father I've made known unto you. Okay, now, Gentiles' view of leadership is a similar to a bully. Okay, and... Uh, the, for example, in the public schools of state education, they, they have what they call as a zero tolerance for bullies. But how are they funded? They're funded because they're bullies. So it's a contradictory thing. If the state education wouldn't be a bully, they wouldn't have money to fund their position so they can have a zero tolerance for bullies. It makes no sense. Okay, government entities are the ones who demonstrate this idea where Jesus talks about lording it over them. In the military especially. Okay, in the military, they verbally beat down them soldiers where that soldier is subjected to them without question. That's why they want the younger 18 and 19 and 20. When they get up to be 27, they have too much of a mind to think through things. Okay, and so we see that. Now, the... Uh, in nature, in nature, animals have a pecking order, okay? And that pecking order is enforced by violence. Can't, I'm not going to change my chickens. They're going to still be violent on each other. Okay, now this methods of being a bully is ingrained in the Gentile culture. And people tend to think that's normal. 
Okay, most of us, as how you were raised, you think everybody raises their children that way. This way all families are, and that's not true. Each family is different. Okay, now, many in the media will complain about the president having a bully pulpit. They didn't complain about it with Obama. But he's a bully. Okay, anybody in that position is a bully. Okay, governing authorities enforce their opinions. They call them laws, but they enforce their opinions. How? By being a bully. It's called enforcement. Okay, now, unfortunately, uh, this was warned to pastors. I say that's not unfortunate, but unfortunately, many pastors, because they're Gentiles, operate like bullies. He's a strong leader. He's a strong pastor. Yeah, and you question him, you'll see. Why? Because he's a bully. I can remember up at First Baptist Hammond uh, on a Sunday night, Sunday night church at 7, question and answer at 6. And so you could raise your hand and ask Jack Hiles any question you want. If there was a question that was asked that he didn't like, boy, did the spirit change. And then nobody wanted to ask a question after that. Why? Because he bullied people into that position. And when he got challenged about some of the things happening behind the scenes, you really see that his bully attitude came out. Okay, so a lot of independent Baptists, they, the preachers run their churches, how? Like a bully. A lot of them do it. If they don't do it publicly, they'll get somebody else to do their work. I, I heard of a story out in Australia where the one pastor, for some reason, he didn't like people chewing gum in church. Like, I care. Just don't pop it. But yeah, uh, and so there's a guy in the church that would go to certain people. You know, you know the preacher don't like you chewing gum, so you shouldn't be chewing gum. I'm of the opinion you ought to be happy they walk in the door, just as long as they're not snoring. Okay, but still, that's like, get over it. We're not here to serve him. We're here to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm here to serve. As a leader, when I was a kid, I was 13 years old, big whopping four foot, 10 inches tall. Been driving a tractor for about three or four years at that time. And I got to detasseling. Has anybody ever detasseled? Okay, now you know what work is. That's milking a cow upside down. Okay. Okay, and uh, so... Because as a farm kid, I was put as a foreman right off the bat. Four foot, ten inches, whopping tall, and I'm the leader of a crew. How am I going to do that? I'm not going to bully them. Okay, and what I did is I worked beside them. Kid getting worn out, I'd just start picking tassels for him about 100 feet or so. And he'd take a break, and he would appreciate that. Okay, there's no yelling and screaming at him. If you would look in Proverbs 29, have you ever experienced this before? Proverbs 29, though, the wise sage has uh, a, some verses to show how to be a leader of people, but to be a gentle leader of people where they enjoy being under your authority. If they don't, it's not tolerated. They enjoy it. In fact, they don't want to go any other place. They don't want anybody else in charge. Proverbs 29, 17, or 29, uh, let's see, 19 first. Okay, it says, a servant will not be corrected by words, for though he understand, he will not answer. You ever see that demonstrator? Foreman thinks, I'm, gent- I'm, I'm going to get this guy doing it. So he yells and screams at the guy, and the guy he yelled and screamed at walked away like he didn't even say anything. Why? He doesn't have a right. Well, I got the authority. Yeah, but that person is not going to accept the belittling, the berating from you because you're not in the right position in a relationship with him. Okay, so verse 19, a servant will not be corrected by words. Who will be corrected by words? Verse 17, correct thy son and he shall give thee rest. Why? Why is that way that way? He shall bring delight into thy soul. Because you have a relationship with him and the son knows already that you love him. And if there's time you do maybe have to raise your voice to him or be stern or say something like that, this is what I want you to do. Do you understand me? Yes, dad. 
Okay, because he sees their love already. So what do you do with somebody who's a servant who doesn't have that relationship? Verse 21 says, he that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at the length. So a good new guy on a job does something wrong, you don't chew him out. You say, well, you probably didn't understand. Okay, uh, you know, it, it, it's a problem we got. And so uh, you gently guide him and say, now here's, here's the way we'd like it done. And the person will react to that, will respond, will appreciate not getting yelled at. And then this person says, wow, this guy, he, he's kind, he cares for me. He's my, he's my boss, but he cares for me. I appreciate something like that. Uh, most businesses are controlled and operated by the methods of bully. Any of us know, all of us know about that. Uh, if you would ask superstar athletes, people admire Michael Jordan, ask the guys who played on his team what they think of Michael Jordan. Ask Scottie Pippen in private, a horse man. What was he like as a teammate? What a jerk! Why? Bully. Kobe Bryant, same way. Why? Because they're thinking in order to get their way, they've got to bully it down the throat of those guys. Why? That's how Gentiles do it. Okay? The home environment often gravitates toward a bully environment. Jen, I was in uh, Walgreens, or, uh, uh, Walmart last night, and I could hear this guy, Gracie Allen! I think that was her name. I, I remember Gracie. I forget the middle name. And you know, as a kid, when you say first middle name, you're in trouble. And they were in the shoe part, and he's yelling, at, ring, 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 ring. and so I just thought, I'm going to watch this. You know, in grocery stores, in the cereal aisle, they should put train up a child right in the middle of that. You ever wish you had train up a child in your back pocket when you're in grocery stores? Yeah. And so I'm watching, and they, that kid had him trained. He thought he had the child trained. She got him trained. And then another time, another situation. Now, stop doing that. Okay, the volume was just at lower level, and I knew he didn't mean it. She knew he didn't mean it. She didn't stop. Then he said, Gracie Allen! Okay, now he meant it. And she stopped. What was it? That was a bully. Why can't you just train your child gently that you could look at them with your eye and shake your head and that child will change. You see, a lot of child abuse is done because somebody hasn't trained their child. And you should be able to control your children with your eyes. Why? Because they know you love them and they want to please you. You see, and that's the matter of training a child. Uh, marriages with one bully usually ends up in divorce unless that one subjects him or herself to the wishes of the bully. And they're not happy. If there's two bullies, it will end up in divorce. Why? Because both are jockeying for the position. The Lord Jesus demonstrated there's a different approach to leadership. Now, the continual record of this in the Bible and in gospel shows that it is a major problem. Okay, now, most of us, if you think about, okay, how do you break a horse to be able to ride the horse? Now, the word itself, I just gave it out. How do we think that you get a horse, somebody to ride it, is you've got to break it? That's a bully method. That's a young man's method. Uh, Jeff Adams, several years ago, showed us how to, how to ride a horse without breaking the horse. It was fascinating. We watched it out of Peterson's. And he had had this horse, never been ridden. And he was, he was explaining that this horse is like an unsaved man. And he was portraying God. And then he was going to show how to get on that horse without the horse ever reacting. And it took about an hour. It was fascinating. I, I video recorded it. And what he did for about the first 20 to 30 minutes is he just spooked the horse in the corral. And that thing just ran everywhere. Just ran, 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 ran. And after 30 minutes, he's, that horse was in the corner and it's all tuckered out. He said, now watch this. I'm going to walk up to the horse, turn around, walk away, and that horse is going to follow me. And that's exactly what that horse did. 
followed him right to where he stopped. He turned around and touched the horse's nose and started touching that animal. If the animal drink, he'd back off and he'd just start touching them. And he would touch that horse everywhere. And then uh, he's standing beside the horse and he would jump up on it with his belly on it. And he would just, and if the horse would move, he'd jump off. And then he'd touch the horse. And then he would jump on it and then he'd touch the horse. He'd touch that horse everywhere. And whenever that horse reacted, he'd jump off. And then he took a blanket and put it on the back of the horse. And if the horse didn't like it, he'd pull it off. He'd put the blanket back on. He'd touch the horse. And then he would jump on a horse on the belly, touch the horse all over the place. The horse was relaxed. And then he got a saddle, put the saddle on it. And then he tied that saddle up. And then he put his foot in the stirrup and stood on the stirrup and just watched the reaction of that horse. If that horse did anything, he'd jump off and he'd touch the horse and he'd put his foot in the stirrup and, uh, stirrup and stand up again. And then all of a sudden he's sitting on top of that thing. Never bucked him. Not one time. And then all of a sudden he just kicks it and it starts walking off. That's a different method. That's a different method. You see, that's the kind of method the Lord Jesus uses. And that's being a quiet leader. So I'm going to give you some thoughts this morning. If you would look in Leviticus chapter 6. How many times do you hear a sermon preached out of Leviticus? The first illustration, uh, the example is political entities. Now, political entities, uh, call it government if you want to call it that, even though that's a made-up name, it's a, it's a legal fiction. But still, people have a mindset of what they think government is. Any government, doesn't matter what title you want to put on it, if you want to put it a republic, a democracy, a monarchy, an oligarchy, uh, Nazism, fascism, communism, socialism. It doesn't matter the title. Okay? Uh, they'll use these two methods. There's nothing that's going to change on that. These are the two methods that's used. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord and lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered to him to keep or in fellowship or... Okay, here's one method. Or in a thing taken away by violence, or hath deceived his neighbor. Those last two, those are the two methods. Deception or violence. How do they get the property of another is by deception or violence. That's the two choices. Violent, Jesus said about the kingdom of heaven, that the violent take it by force. Matthew 11, verse 12. That's the two methods. Okay, then he says, Or hath found that which is lost, and lieth concerning it. So the little adage, finders, keepers, losers, weepers, that's not biblical. That verse says that. And sweareth falsely, in any of all these that a man doeth sinning therein. Then shall it be, because he hath sinned, and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took violently away, or the thing which he hath deceitfully gotten, and then so forth down the line. Okay, those are the two methods. Now, why are those the two methods? It's the same methods of a bully. Okay, a bully that has the high ground, okay, they know they have the high ground, will belittle, berate, verbally abuse the party to get what they want. Okay, and if that doesn't do the trick, outright smack them around. Violence. Okay, that's when they're in the high ground. If they feel they're on the low ground, they don't have that high ground, then they will manipulate or deceive. In a, in a home situation, a husband or wife, usually the female will manipulate. I've done all these things for you. Why can't you do that for me? I changed your diapers. I did this. I, did, I just can't believe you did that. It hurt me so bad. That's manipulation. Or the bully aspect, and that's usually the men. Okay, the verbal abuse. Ripping the words. The words are cutting the soul. And often, some of us have seen, I've watched this, that a woman that is verbally abused will eventually try to leave the situation and then what? Go right back to it. 
And people say, I don't understand that. There's a reason for that. Okay, and there, uh, there's a reason why that person has been beat down to a subject and they don't know anything else. Okay, so manipulation by deception is one method to gain the property of another. Okay, the other way is enforce violence in order to gain property. Okay, perfect example, property taxes. You ever look at the paper? It used to not have a dollar sign on it. It just got numbers. What do them numbers represent? I asked. Grains of sand, kernels of corn. No, I asked him one time. Well, that's, uh, that's a bill. I said, what do you want in payment? Uh, well, we'd take check or credit card. I said, in what form are you demanding payment? They won't answer that question. Because when I say, in what form are you demanding payment, the fraud will be made known. Simple question. United States dollars, I'll go see if I can find them. I go to the bank and ask for United States dollars, and they don't have those. They got Federal Reserve notes. Will you take that in payment? How about Guiana money? How about uh, Aussie dollars? What dollars are you looking for? It's a fraud perpetrated. Now, if you, I'm not telling you not to pay it. If you don't, violence will be made manifest. See, that's the two methods. That's how you get the property of another. Deception or violence. That's the two choices. Okay, and so uh, if the bully perceives he has the advantage, he will enforce his wishes through intimidation and fear. Fear is a good method to control people. If you would look in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. During the tribulation time period, how will the Antichrist control people? The world will be deceived. How will he do that? It will be by fear. By fear. The news media is constantly trying to scare you and I. Constantly. If you're having a good day, you turn on the news for 10 minutes, you will walk away discouraged. Oh, I'm going to die of cancer if I breathe. I'm going to die of cancer if I drink this. I'm going to, oh, the terrorists are coming in. Oh, North Korea is going to blow everybody up. I mean, it got, you all, it got everybody scared. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14 says, But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror. Neither be troubled. That's a modern catch word. Now the advantage of a bully is he gets his way. Now his way might be okay. It might be a good way. Okay, it might be something right. Okay, but he gets his way. If that way is right, he thinks in his mind that his methods are proper, but the followers do not have a close relationship with him. They don't want to be around him. And they operate under fear. The wounded party is not happy. They're not happy with the relationship and deeply hurt. The disadvantage of a bully is people don't want to be around him. What are the intentions of say, children around a bully. You don't know until he gets away from the bully. And then you know their true intentions. The Lord is masterful in this because he wants voluntary friends and love. Hence, our God's not a bully. All pagan deities are bullies. That's the second thought. All pagan deities or religions operate in a bully manner. If you read church history, and I know that's forbidden in the public schools, if you read church history, when the Roman Catholic Church gets in power, the Inquisition is the result. A bully, violence. If you don't agree with us, we're going to kill you. If they are not in power, they will encourage church unity and harmony through manipulation and deception until they get in power. Manipulation or a bully. Uh, The Muslim faith is the same way. The Muslim faith is the exact same way. When they are in power, they will enforce Sharia law. If they're not in power, oh, they're a peaceful, happy religion, and everybody wants to be a Muslim. Except women. And the women, American women that 
Mary, a Muslim's got to have rocks for brains. Okay, so um, Mormonism, same way. Mormonism in power, read what Joe Smith and they did to people. In power, blood atonement. What's that? That's if you apostatize from the Mormon faith, you must be sacrificed. Your blood must be shed. Blood atonement. It's a Mormon doctrine. They still enforce it, only they do it through hitmen now. And then you pull police files in Salt Lake City and stuff like that. That's a, See, Baptist pastors, pastors that talk about pastoral authority, what you're dealing with is you're going to deal with a bully eventually. I watched this one pastor. He's mad at another preacher out in Phoenix. He said, come here, I'm going to beat him up. Oh, wow. I thought striker was one of the qualifications we're not supposed to have. But that's, that's a, stroke, quote, a strong leader. No, that's a Gentile bully. That's all that is. Most discussions about religion or God eventually gravitate towards fear. If you don't agree with me, you're going to die and go to hell. See, that's the methods. Why is that true? Why is that that way? It's because that's how Gentiles think things are to run. Jesus Christ is something different. Now, with this in mind, there, there, I need to say something on this. The idea, there is a law of life. It's called the rule or the right of the creator or owner. Okay, the right of a creator or owner allows that person to rule according to his wishes. Okay, someone who starts a company. They have a right to run that company as they choose. Okay, how they choose. Now, hopefully they're not a bully. If they are a bully, they're going to have an employing relationship that's going to be a continual turnover. Continue. Why? Because people don't put up with that. Okay, but the owner or the creator, there is a chain of command in life. The God of our Bible did create a chain of command. Okay, in the home, it's the dad, the mom, and the, the children. I don't, it, even in these dyke relationships... There's going to be a butch and a queen. Uh, they're not getting away from it. The same with the male part. There's going to be a masculine one. There's going to be a feminine one. And that's the chain of command. Okay, now the family unit has a chain of command according to the will of our creator. Children were given life by God and their parents. And that right there is enough to appreciate them. Maybe they're bullies. Most are, but we can learn from it. Parents will raise them according to their wishes. We all do it. Hopefully our wishes are according to God's. But even at that, a wise parent will lovingly guide and train his children with the child's best interests at heart. As that child grows, we understand that they have a liberty. They're developing a liberty. They're spreading their wings. They're learning to be an adult. And so we got to shift as adults, okay, and we got to recognize the natural desires of being independent is normal and natural, and we want to try to help them through that, okay? And in some areas of life, the chain of command you join in voluntarily, for example, your job, whatever job it is, you know in order to get this job, there are some rules that the owner wants, and if you can't comply with the rules, you need to leave, if you can comply with it in order to have an income or, a, you know, an occupation, okay, then you voluntarily choose to obey their rules. The Bible says submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Okay, so that's like on the job. Okay, if somebody chooses to put their children in private schooling, any private schooling is going to have some rules. And you are voluntarily subjecting yourself to these rules in order to get this schooling. And if you can't comply with the rules, if you don't agree with the rules, then don't go there. Don't try to change the rules from within because that's not what the creators or the ones in charge of the school want. If you violate the rules, there's a breach of contract, hence a punishment takes place. And if you gripe about that, get over it because that's the school's right. They don't take any government money. They can do what they wish. Okay, and so that's in that realm. Uh, 
if you, when you and I are traveling, okay, all of us are now within a municipality called Lowell, the town of Lowell. It is a corporation. This is the deception that's passed off on Americans. Okay, when you drive into Lowell, it says town of Lowell. That's not just to welcome you to come into this town. That is a legal notice saying that you're coming into this corporation and you've got to abide by the corporate bylaws. And the bylaws are the speeding, tra are the traffic regulations. And maybe if you have a house in this town, you've got to abide by the regulations. If you don't like the corporate bylaws, then don't drive through or get out. Okay, and if you drive through and violate one of the, by the bylaws of the corporation, then they will tax you more. It's called a ticket. Unless you want to move it into county court and have a little fun with that. Okay? And that's, that's the deception that's pushed off Americans. Several years ago, you had what a group of people called Occupy. A bunch of socialists. Oh, they were mad at government. Government did, government did. You know, oh, they were mad at corporations. Oh, corporations, this corporation, that corporations. And we need government to step in to take care of these corporations. Yeah, but what's government? The United States is a corporation. It's a corporation founded in England. Go to the Queen of England. She's the richest person in the world. She owns Australia, Canada. She owns a corporation of the United States. It's a corporate body. And here they're trying to, they're upset with the corporations that actually do something productive and shift it to a corporation that doesn't anything productive. You see, and that's, that's the deception that has been pushed on Americans, and we don't understand it. We don't understand these things. And often when you go into court, what the problem is is a breach of contract of your trust agreement. And then that's a whole other issue. But I'm saying is that everywhere we got, you know, I find it so funny, you see these Hell's Angels guys, you know, rebel tattoos, you know, Hell's Angels, you know. I don't know, what, you know, what the difference between a Hoover vacuum cleaner and a guy at Harley Davidson is the Harley Davidson has a dirt bag in the outside. Okay, and so uh, <laughs> I'm a motorcycle rider, so no problem. I rode one this morning. Okay, but uh, the idea is you see these guys, you know, they're rebels of society. You know, we don't listen to anybody. We don't do what anybody says. And they dutifully go down to the BMV and get their plate and their driver's license and they have insurance and they're not paid to drive anywhere. See, they're going to do what they're told. You see? And when we don't comply with that, it's a breach of contract. Okay? So the idea is, is what most people perceive to be government isn't. It's corporations. But this is the right. The, there's a right of a creator or owner. Okay? The, the right of an owner of a business can run his business as he wishes. Now, if he wants to run his business as the Lord wants him, then he's not going to be a bully over the people that serve under him. He will treat them with kindness, and they will enjoy the relationship, and they won't have such a turnover rate. The turnover rate is showing that people don't like the relationship. An author, a composer, a playwright has the authority to act according to his or her wishes. They created it. And God's the same way. The owner of a business or company has the right to act according to his wishes. And if any of us get in a leadership position, hopefully we can lead as the Lord Jesus wants us to lead. And people will feel comfortable and be pleased with the relationship. And they have a good working relationship rather than I'm mad at you, I'm mad at you, I hate you, I hate you, and coming through here. A biblical leader is the last thought. A biblical leader uses his position of authority for the best interest of others. Jesus said to his apostles, I'm calling you my friends. Not servants. You're my friends. We're going to work together. Now, I find it interesting. The apostle Paul, when he referenced the Lord Jesus about our walk in life, Okay, the Apostle Paul, what did he do before he got saved? Murdered people, persecuted God's children, hurt Jesus Christ massively. He got saved. 
And then as years go by, he refers to the Lord Jesus in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. He refers to him as gentle and meek. Isn't that something? If Jesus Christ was a manipulator, he would have said, Paul, you hurt me terribly by killing my children. You hurt me drastically. I can't believe you did these things to hurt me. So I want you to serve me. That'd be serving out of guilt trying to please somebody who's whining. Okay, if Jesus was a bully, he'd say, you dirty scumbag, you killed my people, and now you want me to save you. Okay, I'll save you, but you're going to serve me, and I demand you to serve me. That'd be service under fear. Paul served the Lord Jesus Christ out of charity. He loved him. Because Jesus forgave him, cleansed him, and boom, he served him. You talk about a guy serving the Lord. Probably the best ever. And he refers to our Lord and Savior as gentle and meek. You know, how do the Muslim faith draw, try to get people into their faith? Deception or violence? That's the two choices. How does the Lord invite people to come to him? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me. All you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Now, I don't know about you, that's a good deal. That is a good deal. And in that offer, what he's doing is he's discovering voluntary friends. And that's what we want. A voluntary friendship rather than a forced friendship. You see, a bully doesn't know who his real friends are. Why? Because he don't have any. You see, a bully, he might have the right goal. The goal might be right, but the method is wrong. In his mind, the end justifies the mean. The Lord Jesus Christ is one that simply says to people, come unto me, all you that labor heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You're tired? You're tired? I'll help you out. Now, when he helps us out, doesn't mean we're going to sit around and do nothing for him, because he does say, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. People voluntarily desire to yield to the wisdom and wishes of a biblical leader. Generally speaking, I know you're going to have your exceptions. But a husband and wife situation, she will want to yield to his wisdom and wishes because he is concerned for her. He takes care of her. He meets her emotional needs. He serves, except for washing dishes. That's why you buy dishwashers. Because arthritis is terrible when you wash dishes. But you do what you can to be a servant and to work together as a team. You know, that first song we sang, The Fight Is On, O Christian Soldier, that's a good wedding song. First song, we've, The Fight Is On, O Christian Soldier. It's like uh, one time a little kid asked his dad, he said, Dad, what's a weapon? He says, that's something you fight with. He says, is mom your weapon? That's That's a sad thing. And so the Lord, a biblical leader by the Lord Jesus Christ, is a, we'll use our position of authority when need be, but it's for the best interest of others. It's not for my way. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, we'll stop and pray. Lord, I do ask and pray that you'd help us to love you more, admire you more, uh, recognize the wisdom in uh, your methods. When you said, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Oh, what a wise thing that people come to you voluntarily and serve you because they love you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us at, when we get opportunities to witness or to lead others, that we might do it in a fashion that we can be quiet leaders, gentle leaders, still get accomplished what needs to be done. But Lord, I just pray you'd help us to see the great wisdom the infinite wisdom that you have in your words. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed with that.